They prey upon the smallest of victims, but their deeds have a huge impact. They are pedophiles, and what they do is so awful that society can go to dangerous lengths to try to stop them. This man says when he was eight years old, his own mother took him to bed and molested him. And at age eight, you do whatever your mother says. Certainly my mother. So I did exactly what she told me. Caught making obscene phone calls in his 40s, he finally divulged how he had suffered for years. And I cried. I've never cried like that before in my life. Children at a daycare center said their teacher did hideous things. Nude dancing um, 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 implements um, inserted into children, um, that type of thing. But were they coached by overzealous adults into believing a horrible lie? But they believe a story that there was a bad person named Kelly who her kids. They're not lying, but that doesn't mean it happened. And the neighbors were incensed when a convicted pedophile moved into their community. I'm mad as hell that they can move a sex molester in across the street from my kids. Sexual abuse of children. The mere accusation horrifies on Against the Law. I'm Jose Diaz Balart. An adult lures a young child into a bedroom. The door closes. A sex act occurs. It's not supposed to happen to a kid, but it's estimated that 10% of American children are molested, and the harm can last a lifetime. Consider the prominent man we're about to meet. Richard Berenson says his mother violated him, starting when he was eight years old. And he told Connie Chung in 1993 that triggered his own obscene behavior 40 years later. He was the president of American University, who in 10 years turned a so-called party school into a respected institution. I was a nanny. I ran a child care business in my home. I put an ad in the paper. He was a noted astronomer, called upon frequently to explain the universe to audiences everywhere. He would use two different names throughout the weeks that I talked to him. He was an influential leader in the nation's capital who rubbed elbows with the Washington elite. He asked if I had an open family. If his son wanted to lay down, if I would, if I would nap with him, hug him and cuddle him and do all that stuff. And I said yes, and then it, you know, he got a little more graphic. He was a loving and devoted husband and father. As the conversation went on and I, I made him feel comfortable, he started talking about more graphic things, um, sexual things. And uh, I just felt he needed to be caught. Back in 1990, Richard Berenson was at the pinnacle of his career until the day his life came crashing down around him. I found out who he was. The police investigator called me and told me to watch the news. Yesterday, AU officials, in a letter to the university community, said that Dr. Berenson's resignation was in response to allegations concerning Berenson's personal actions. In the spring of 1990, Richard Earl Berenson was caught making obscene phone calls from his office, the president's office at American University. I didn't understand it. I said to the doctors, please help me. I, I made these calls, and I don't know why. They said, we will, but you have to cooperate, and I did. I had no idea what I was walking into. What Richard Berenson was walking into was Johns Hopkins Sexual Disorders Clinic and his past, a past that he had struggled to forget, a history he couldn't escape. When you were eight years old, something happened that dramatically changed your life. Yeah, it did. My family always had this curious relationship. My dad had one bedroom, my mother had another, and I had yet another. And one day I came in the house and I heard strange sounds from the middle bedroom, which was my mother's bedroom. So I was curious and I went to the door and pushed it open and lo and behold, my mother and father were together. Something I don't think I'd ever really seen them together. I'd never seen anyone nude before, much less my parents. It was shocking. I don't know, what is this? Started to leave. And 
And then my mother said, come here. Stark in his terror, just two syllables, come here. It's commanding. And at age eight, you do whatever your mother says. Certainly my mother. So I did exactly what she told me. So I dutifully took off my clothes and joined them in bed. And I learned more than I should have known, more than I wanted to know. And then more curious yet, an hour later, we're having dinner quietly like any other family. No one says anything. There is no explanation. Richard Berenson was the only child of Earl and June Berenson. When he was four, he became very ill and spent the next three years confined to his bed. His mother took care of him around the clock. He says she was obsessed with him. Tell me about your mother. What was she like? She was a free spirit. She was bright, vivacious, articulate, but also deeply ill. All of my life, deeply she Ill. mentally ill, she would be full of life and full of laughter and vivacious and strange, sort of a real life Lucille Ball. Then, instantly, she would turn, slap me against the wall, shake me furiously, shout at me, scream. But it wasn't until Richard was eight years old that the sexual abuse had begun. That day, he walked in on his parents in the middle bedroom. Richard hoped it wouldn't happen again, but it did. Three years later, when Richard was summoned by his mother to a dark room where she had been trying to make a living as a photographer. Everything in the room was black except for the metallic counters. And out of that blackness, I simply heard the two words again, come here. And so I did. And into the blackness I stepped and she shut the door behind me and then I found that she was there on the counter, uh, nude or semi-nude, and I soon felt devoured by my own mother. It's hideous almost beyond belief, and after all these years, after these decades, in fact, it's painful to say the words, and it was agonizing at the time, confusing, grotesque, sad, and part of the sadness came with momentary twinges of pleasure and say this delicately but for a male it maybe becomes particularly confusing because it's terribly hard to deny to yourself that you're not somehow responding when you can visibly see that you are and yet you hate it it is as if your body has betrayed you how long did this go on many months perhaps a year year and a half something like that and then it ended as abruptly as inexplicably as it had begun there was no final grand explanation it just didn't happen again he says the beatings and sexual abuse stopped when he was 12 but his mother became increasingly ill when Richard was 14 his father finally had her committed to a mental institution eventually she was released a shadow of the woman she once was. Richard, determined not to let the past dictate his future, concentrated all his energy on studying. Southern Methodist University, MIT, Harvard, assistant professor of physics and astronomy at Boston University, full professor and dean at American University. I am honored to accept the presidency of the American University, not as a title, but as a trust. At 41, he became president of American University. Seven years later, his father died, and Berenson had to go back to his childhood home, to the middle bedroom, to pick up the suit that his father would be buried in. It was there, at that moment, that all the memories came rushing back. I relived, in a matter of seconds, decades of what I had carefully concealed and built over for myself. I thought I'd die. In a way, I almost wished that I would. But I had responsibilities. So I got my composure and said, that was then, this is now. I'll get back in personal control and get on with it. It didn't hurt you, after all. You're university president. And so I clicked it off. You clicked it off, and you didn't know that you needed to get some help then? I should have sought help when I got back to Washington. I didn't. I know this may sound preposterous, but I thought I was maybe the only one. 
I thought that maybe in all of this nation, I was the only male that ever fit into my category. When the president of American University, Richard Berenson, paid a visit to his childhood home, the painful memories came flooding back. He says they were memories of a mother who had sexually molested him as a child. As Connie Chung continues the story, Berenson is trying desperately to hide and to make sense of his terrible secret. Berenson retreated back to his work. 90-hour weeks became 120-hour weeks. Then one day he read a news article about some children who claimed they were sexually molested at a daycare center in California. That's when he says he got the idea to call daycare centers to try and find out why people sexually abuse children. He picked up the phone mm -hmm. and a woman answered. A woman answered and had a perfectly pleasant, brief conversation, inconsequential. And then I obliquely insinuated that in my family, uh, sexuality around the children was uh, OK. We were not shy about it. A totally fictional family, of course, and totally untrue with respect to my real family. And I said it to hear the response. Well, invariably, the other party didn't understand or would say, well, we don't do that in our home. And I'd say, yeah, well, we haven't done it much in ours either. And we'd chat for another two or three minutes very politely. And the conversation would end. I'd hang up the phone. And I'd sit there in my chair thinking, what in God's name was that? Why? It has nothing to do with my day. And I'd look at my daily agenda. My God, in four minutes, I have to give a speech. I'm chairing a conference. I'm going downtown for an interview. Click that off, and away I went. And so weeks, months would go by, and there were very few such calls. I don't know how many, six, eight, maybe, over a period of several years until we got to 1990. That's the year when he began to call Susan Allen, a local housewife who ran a daycare center in her home. He talked to me mainly. He talked to my husband a couple of times. Um, very, very detailed, graphic, gross, horrible things having to do with all children. And as the discussions, the conversations became more sordid, I became more disturbed by it. And for the first time, I didn't quite end when I'd hang up the phone. I, I would feel almost nauseous about it. And hours later, I'd think, what was that? And yet it became almost a compulsion to call again. Police put a trap on the phone. And over a period of about two weeks, I guess I got probably 40, 50 phone calls. I had to get him to call me back six times on the last day because they had to have six tracings to the exact same number, I guess, to make it official. I got a, a phone call from the chairman of the board of trustees at the university on a Saturday. And he said, there's a group of trustees uh, we're meeting downtown and we'd like for you to meet with us. It's, uh, it's serious, a serious issue. And could you come when he right got now? there, they told him the police had traced some calls to a telephone line at the university and that a detective had played a tape of the calls for the university's lawyer. And all five men stared at me in this eerie, awful silence. And I just felt my heart had fallen out of my body. And I um, said, I'm deeply embarrassed. And um, it was me on the, on the line. Berenson then picked up the phone and called his wife, Gail. The part that I remember is uh, I have resigned from the presidency. And uh, I, I know that he said more, but that was the part that I heard. And I said, I love you, and I'll be here waiting. And that's what I did. A day or two later, former president of the university, a man who was chairing the budget commission for the capital city of the United States, was self-admitted into a locked-in psychiatric ward at Massive Johns Hopkins in a sexual disorders clinic with a small room four feet away from two child abusers. It was a twist in space and time and catapulting me to another world. 
The doctors at Hopkins were relentless. They wanted to make sure that Berenson hadn't actually abused any children. They came to the conclusion that he had not. But they did ask him the question that opened the door to the past he had worked so hard to forget. Tell me about your first sexual experience. I just sat and cried. Here I am, PhD, a man, and I cried. I've never cried like that before in my life, and I couldn't answer him. And he had all the time needed. He just handed me more tissues. And how long did it take? Long time. And finally, for the first time in my life, with any person, anywhere, any time, I broke this code of silence. And I said, my first sexual encounter was at age eight. And I told him. It was there like a pressure cooker, and eventually it broke through in terms of what he'd been denying and began to have a clear influence on his actions. Dr. Fred Berlin, founder of the Johns Hopkins Sexual Disorders Clinic, believes that the calls were Berenson's way of seeking information about why a mother would have sex with her child. And in his mixed up, troubled way, decided if he could call women who were doing this, get them to talk to him, uh, gain their confidence, discuss with them why they were doing what they were doing. Maybe this would bring him some understanding. After a month at Hopkins, Berenson went to court and pleaded guilty to making indecent phone calls. He was sentenced to two 30-day jail terms. Both were suspended on the condition that he remain in therapy, which he did for a year as an outpatient. The university wanted to buy out his contract, but Berenson said no. Today, he is back at American University as a professor of physics. His marriage is stronger than ever. He and his wife have devoted themselves to helping children in situations of abuse and domestic violence, everything from working with the local police. And what happens to the eight-year-old who's sexually abused and has no place to turn? Well, is that the role of the police? To teaching astronomy to foster children. Here's a model of the moon. Let me, let me have you feel this thing. Berenson is even a member of the advisory board at Johns Hopkins, often sitting in on group therapy with convicted child molesters. I pray that I will never do that again, that I will never act out against a child again. Do you think people will still judge your husband uh, on the calls that he made? I hope that people will judge my husband for being the courageous person that I see him as. I mean, I, I can't tell you how incredibly painful it is to sit and listen to my husband talk about incest. I mean, it's, it's such a horrible, horrible thing. Through all of this, you have never uttered the word incest. Hard word to say. It may be the ugliest word in the English language. It is, in a way, a combination of two other hideous words in concept, rape and murder. It's the rape of a child and the murder of a childhood. But, finally, I found the courage to say it. Yes, I was a victim of incest. Even now, it just chills me to say that. But I'm not alone. There are millions across this country, and they need to know they are not alone. Richard Berenson is still an astronomer at American University. Seven years have now passed since he was forced to reveal the secrets of his abused childhood and began the therapy that changed his life for the better. Very few criminal sentences last for life. Nearly every convict eventually gets released from custody. But when the offense is the sexual abuse of a child, communities are especially uneasy about letting the criminal return to society. Peter Van Sant found one such town in 1993. This is 5.55 a.m. Morning, son. Open observation post. I'll go make some coffee. 
It's not even dawn yet outside Welch, Minnesota. Seeing anything? No. But Mike Nemchek yeah. and Phil Litterer are already standing guard. Yeah. They are up. Watching a house across the street. Inside, there's a man they are convinced could attack neighborhood children at any moment. As soon as he's out of uh, the house, he could be danger to the, the community. There goes the light. We've got to go out. We're watching to see Peter. We're looking to see to make sure he is here. That's the school bus. My grandkids go to school at this time of the morning. They are waiting for a bus about half a mile from here. It wouldn't be safe for me not to know that they got on safety on the bus. You could be hiding in the bushes and just jump out at us. Nemchek's grandchildren Bye. leave for the bus at this time every morning. What goes through your mind as you watch your children walk into the darkness? Well, I'm worried that I'm hoping they'll be safe. He's down there now. Pete's down there now. Pete is Peter Anderson, a mildly retarded, four-time convicted child molester who the state says has every right to live in the neighborhood. But these men fear he could strike again. He's out there by himself. The school bus just went by. Yeah. That's why we're here. How do we know what he would do or wouldn't do had, if we're not here? We are just playing scared. Scared to death. That's it. The whole community is scared. I'm mad as hell that they can move a sex molester in across the street from my kids and put me through this. So as this day goes along... Makes me very uncomfortable. Like every day here, the neighbors will take turns standing guard over Peter Anderson and protesting the fact that he's here at all. These people are among hundreds across the country who believe that the system has gone haywire allowing convicted child molesters back into the same neighborhoods that they victimized. Peter Anderson's victims include a nine-year-old girl who he tried to rape. This video of him was shot by the protesters themselves. Anderson was advised not to talk to us, but his sister Sue McDonald did. Do you believe that Peter Anderson is still a dangerous man to children? No, I don't. He's been in a good program that's been helping him out. I don't feel he's an animal or a monster. He's paid for his crime. He's lived there for a year. I feel, yeah, he has a right to live in the country if that's his choice. I think, I think it's very unfair. It's like I say, you know, they claim it's such an innocent protest. Well, it's not, because nobody should have to live like what they've been treating him as. People who criticize you say you're a bunch of vigilantes taking the law into your own hands, and you're denying a citizen his right just to live. Steal my car, I might forgive you. And if my children, no. If, if we don't stand up for the, uh, for, the, for the rights of these kids, who's going to? Who's going to look out for these kids? The state? The state put the predator next to the prey. I saw him right here. That's been the attitude in this neighborhood ever since Peter Anderson was first spotted about a year ago. When I seen him here again, I... I lost it. Brian Linnell, who says he's one of Anderson's victims, was among the first to learn Peter Anderson was back in the area. Brian says it meant coming face to face with a personal nightmare from 13 years earlier. I'm going to ask you a tough question. What did Peter Anderson do to you? Um, jeez. What do you want to say? Uh, fondled? Is that how you say it? We went behind the sheds out of the sight of the parents, or the parents couldn't see us, you know. And that's when he molested me. And how old were you? Five, six years old. Six years old, I think it was. I didn't tell my mom and dad right away. You kept this inside for years? Yeah. I didn't even like... tell your parents? No. And then you come down in your car. And, and bam, he's right there. Did this just sort of sweep through the community? I think this it swept world? real fast. Rumors were already flying. The neighbors knew a home for mentally retarded adults was opening, but they say no one ever mentioned anything about a convicted child molester. So they called a meeting with the officials. A superintendent from the Dakota County Hu Department of Human Services stood from you to me away and told me that there would be no criminals living in that house. As he said that, a four-time convicted child molester was living there that night. 
the residents basically are saying your department lied to them, told them there was not going to be a person with a criminal record placed in that house, and there was one. How do you respond? I don't believe they were ever told that. I, I could not verify that. Dave Rooney and Joe Harris are county officials who approved of placing Peter Anderson back in the same community where he committed his crimes. Why would they do such a thing? The fact that Peter Anderson is a mildly retarded offender, what they call developmentally disabled, means the county has to provide him a supervised home. The home they came up with was in his old stomping grounds. If this is a man that you knew was dangerous, why didn't you tell the community before he was placed? A good point. Uh, the matter of fact is we legally cannot. In fact, under Minnesota privacy laws, the community could not be told anything about Peter Anderson. Nothing about why the county was placing him there. Nothing about the treatment he received since his last conviction. Nothing to ease their concerns. They can know everything they want about me because I pay taxes. But because they have molest children, we can't find out a thing about them because God forbid I might step on their rights to privacy. Tim Hoffman and his wife Karen live directly across the street from the group home. Hop in. With few facts about Peter Anderson, they grew increasingly worried about their four-year-old son, Andrew. It's a real disconcerting feeling that we can be watched as we go to the barn like we have to do every day. It feels to me like I'm dangling a mouse in front of a caged cat. The resident over there that has molested children watches my son and can see him as possibly a potential victim. Any car that comes or goes, any person that comes or goes inside that house, we write down, we log it so that we can tell what's going on, who's coming in, who's going out. We've probably been more security than what they have half the time. And since Last Easter, have you been out almost every day? We were out here Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. It doesn't matter whether it's a holiday. The protesters call this protection for neighborhood kids, but Anderson's defenders call it something else. He shouldn't have to be under house arrest, and that's what they got him as. He's very emotional about it all. Calls me up and he said he'd rather be dead than have to live like he's been living. Enough's enough, you know. How much more harassment would you go through? Would you put up with it for a year? We're being attacked as rednecks. We're being accused of being against the retarded. We're being accused of being against group homes. And that's not the issue here at all. It's a totally different issue. And that's why we're upset, is because he is a pedophile. What do we do with these people, then? I think that people who have been convicted three times, four times, we can't afford to put them out on the street again. <laughs> How many neighborhoods would welcome a group home of this type with, into their neighborhood? Would you? Um, that's a tough question. That's a Do tough you have question. Children? Sure. Would I've you grown, want, would you want Peter grown. Anderson living across the street from uh, your kids? That's a tough question. In 1994, a seven-year-old New Jersey girl named Megan Kanka was brutally raped and murdered by a convicted child molester who lived across the street. The publicity led many states and Congress to pass so-called Megan's Laws, designed to inform neighbors when sex offenders moved to town. Since Peter Anderson's release from custody predated Minnesota's law, Officials there say current information about his whereabouts is confidential. The town of Maplewood, New Jersey was shaken to its roots when people suspected that a daycare teacher had sexually molested young children. The kids told shocking stories in court, and the teacher, Kelly Michaels, was convicted and sentenced to 47 years in prison. But after five years behind bars, Michaels won a chance for a new trial, because while the charges against her were appalling, the investigation that convicted her apparently had been just as bad. Richard Schlesinger had the story in 1993. Once upon a time, Kelly Michaels wanted to be an actress. 
She had starred in high school and college plays in Pittsburgh, her hometown. So in 1984, she decided to try to act in New York. She could only afford to live in suburban New Jersey, and she took a job at the We Care Daycare Center to support herself. I felt like I was doing something good and positive, and I could be near New York and make my plans for the future, which was not going to be in childcare. Kelly Michaels was hired as a teacher's aide here at We Care and was quickly promoted to teacher. She only worked here seven months before she moved across town to a better paying school. And then, just a few days into her new job, the police knocked at her door. They just said that they're investigating a charge of uh, child abuse. And that was enough to just totally destroy me. So what did you do? I just remember trying to get myself together. I kept saying, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I, this has got to be some terrible mistake. And they kept assuring me that there were no ch formal charges. They just wanted to talk. So what happened at the end of the day? Well, I took a lie detector test. And they uh, assured me this was a final thing. And if I passed this lie detector, I would be a free woman. And this pretty much would be, be forgotten. I took it. I passed it. They had no choice. They let me go. I believed it was over. So she was released while the first charge was investigated. The case against Kelly Michaels began with a boy in the doctor's office getting his temperature taken. He said, that's what my teacher does to me. His mother was alarmed because the nurse's aide was using a rectal thermometer. Other children were questioned, and soon dozens of kids were saying Kelly Michaels abused them too with knives and forks and spoons and other instruments. But there was never any physical evidence of abuse. Kelly Michaels was convicted on the testimony of children. These kids were interviewed, and if one listens, not even taking my word for it, or the prosecutor's word for it, or even the parents after all this time, but go back to those initial tapes, those interviews, that's the freshest material. Come here, let me ask you a question. Sit down. The children were questioned by social workers, police, and psychologists. Did anyone ever do this to, to the boys in school with the fork? Now, if you remember, tell me, because I need you to tell me. Because your mommy would want you to tell me. She'd be very proud of you if you told me the truth, okay? The fork on a penis. Did anybody ever do that to anybody in school? Yeah. You sure? How about the wooden spoon on the penis? Yeah. How about with the knife? Did anybody ever do this in the boys' rear end? No! They were told a story repeatedly in the most intrusive to me, um, um, oh my God, the most horrible things. They were told these stories. They didn't just come up with these stories. Who is this now? Kelly. Kelly? How'd you like Kelly? In these early interviews, the children either deny anything happened or tell stories they admit they heard from someone else. So how was Kelly? She was bad? I like her, but she was doing nothing to children. What was she doing to the children? I don't know. No? How do you know she was doing bad things? I don't know. Oh, you don't know? Who told you? Lou. Lou? Uh... Lou is Lou Fonalaris, a social worker who did many of the initial interviews. He declined to speak with us. I do believe, that after eight years of litigation, of therapy, of what's going on with their own parents and the prosecutors, that they believe a story that there was a bad person named Kelly who her kids. They're not lying, but that doesn't mean it happened. There is not one doubt in my mind that my child was abused by Kelly Michaels. This Maplewood parent wants to remain anonymous to protect her child. This is from a 1991 interview. I blame myself for bringing my kid there every day. Her child never told her of abuse until after the allegations against Kelly were made. I would like to know even more about what happened there. I don't think some of the children had the words to describe all that went on. All of them learned that something absolutely dreadful had happened to them, something unspeakable. Writer Dorothy Rabinowitz became a supporter after researching the case. So that the same nursery teacher whom they loved and whom they ran to greet with open arms when they saw her, had now been converted into their blackest dreams. Rabinowitz says the children were abused. The children were, of course, molested. They were not molested by Kelly Michaels. By the very people who meant to protect them. They were abused and perhaps scarred for the rest of their lives 
by a trial process because they will go through life believing that something dreadful had happened to them sexually, and this changes one. Two years after she was charged, Kelly Michaels went to trial. Each child came in and told the story in their own way, in their own words. And those children told convincing stories of abuse. My daughter described what has become known as the nude pile-up game. At the trial, children described the nude pile-up game in which they allegedly rolled around on the floor naked. But what became compelling testimony in court started out as a child's tale. This is an early description of the pile-up game. You want to tell me how the game gets played? Yeah, and you take all the chairs, then you have to have to put them on your head. Put the chairs on your head? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. The children were primed and prepared to appear at trial. Kelly Michaels' supporters insist prosecutors molded the children's stories to fit a theory about what happened at the daycare center. They closed the daycare center, and uh, as I have said and other people have noted, uh, the school may have been closed, but the children went to another school. They went to the prosecutor's school, and they learned. These fantastic stories, if any of them were true, these kids would have been talking about them during the school year. These kids wouldn't have kept quiet and have to go through um, training sessions with investigators to come up with them. There was no deliberation in all of this. There was no malice. What we were caught up in was a word we've heard a lot about. It was hysteria. It was not mass hysteria. This woman's child was at We Care. None of the parents wanted to believe that this had occurred, and they did everything possible to convince themselves that this had not occurred. During her trial, Kelly Michaels was represented by public defenders, and some who've reviewed the record have called the defense weak. Once you have seen an innocent person in jail, it is a life-changing experience. For a while, her only defender wasn't even a lawyer. Once you see it, it's different from hearing about it. Reporter Dorothy Rabinowitz began researching the case. I saw her convicted with not a single effort made to begin an appeal. So what'd you do? I set about, I made two promises. One was that I would publish this story in a national magazine to get it all out. And the other was that I would get her an attorney. Was it tough to sell lawyers on taking this case? Tough, it was impossible. If you try to take a 10 and a half month trial without money, try to mount an appeal and ask a lawyer, who's got the money to do that? Finally, she found one. I thank God for Morton's Davis. I knew as soon as I met him. He called me up every morning and would say to me, did this really happen? Morton Stavis, a New York lawyer, prepared the appeal. But then, just before he was to argue the case, he died. I hate the way that I came into it, but, uh, but I, I think it's, it's worked well. Hello? My name's Robert Rosenthal. I'm Kelly Michaels' attorney. It was then up to Stavis' assistant, Robert Rosenthal, to argue Kelly Michaels' appeal. My first appellate appearance was this case. And he was fresh out of law school. First time in court? Uh, I've been in court a few times before that, but, but nothing like this. Uh, it's just small motions, and uh, I've been in housing court before that, but, but nothing like this. Meanwhile, the expense of the appeal threatened to stall it. Thank God I'm a man of means, and I can tell you that even when you have money, justice is very expensive. New York billionaire Leonard Stern began donating to the defense after he read about it in Harper's Magazine. I think that the awful part of hysteria is that the people involved in it believe it. The children, the parents, the prosecutor, a large segment of the community. But this is a woman you've never met. It's the principal. You didn't know if she was guilty or innocent. If it could happen to her, it could happen to any of us. What kind of work are you going to do? The, the, the appeals court that overturned Michael's conviction spent 29 pages criticizing the way the children were questioned. But there were other legal grounds for the reversal. First, the appeals court said the judge prejudiced the jury by allowing the children to sit in his lap and occasionally whispering to them while they testified. The court said, quote, a juror could feel that he was personally offending the judge if he voted for Michaels. And the appeals court also objected to the fact that certain symptoms the children were exhibiting, like bedwetting and nightmares, were considered evidence of abuse. 
The judges said it was not fair to Kelly Michaels to take behaviors that might be normal and use them to prove abuse. Are they going to retry Kelly Michaels? I don't know. I, I hope they're not. It, it, it was a tremendous injustice the first time to Kelly Michaels, certainly, um, to the children. Uh, I would hate to see these parents put their children through that again. But attorney Robert Rosenthal says he believes he'd win an acquittal for Kelly Michaels this time. Uh, I think it became clear uh, fairly early on that we were dealing with a client that we felt was, was an innocent woman. Um, the, the testimony was, was ludicrous. We will vigorously pursue all of the appellate rights that we have. We but Essex County Prosecutor Clifford Minor says a new trial may not even be necessary if the Supreme Court throws out Michael's reversal. We will be going to the Supreme Court very shortly. Most observers believe the Supreme Court will let the reversal stand. And with much of the evidence now suspect, it will be difficult to win another conviction against Kelly Michaels. What's hard for people to believe is that Responsible prosecutors, people who are, who are elected to, to office, the judges, that all these people would allow nine months' worth of trial to go on over charges that are just made up. People think there has to be something to this. Before this, I would have said, oh, I would have been just like that. My, that's what been my opinion. Of course they wouldn't have pr prosecuted a fraudulent case. Of course they wouldn't have manipulated these children and the parents. Of course they wouldn't have treated my life like it was nothing until they railroaded the Constitution and, and, and created this monster out of nothing. But I watched them do it over the course of these years. I've seen them do it. It's what happened. And I'm not the only one that this has happened to. The state Supreme Court went along with the appeals court, and in December 1994, New Jersey prosecutors conceded defeat. The charges against Kelly Michaels were dismissed. A few years earlier, a similar case had made headlines in Southern California. The operators of the McMartin Preschool were charged with molesting more than a hundred children and accused of practices such as devil worship and animal mutilation. A six-year prosecution failed to produce a single conviction. Young people deserve a secure childhood unencumbered by the ills of the world. Molestation of children is a dreadful crime. It is society's duty to keep it from happening. But we have seen that the frenzy caused by charges of sexual abuse can sometimes ruin innocent lives. For Against the Law, I'm Jose Diaz-Balart.